Greg Hildebrandt. I've been a professional artist for 62 years. I've done a lot of artwork in that time, and I'm still just trying to get it right. There, there you are. <laughs> Greetings. How you doing, Greg? Good to All see right, you again. Keith. Doing well. So, uh, what do you got to show us there, sir? This is the final on the Godzilla that we've been have been working on for the last how am I three weeks or so? Three weeks, yeah. I, 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 it's not a steady. I worked on a bunch of other stuff in between too, but basically I stretched it out over three weeks. So, it's done. The gentleman who commissioned me he's approved it. He's happy with it. So. There you go. Nice. So, yeah, thank you for, again, showing us the step-by-step -step and going through the uh, drawing phase to the the painting and how you set all of that up and then showing us the final there, man. Yep. So, well, now... So we got a couple of people uh, already starting to come in and, and watch. So Dean says hi and that the uh, the Godzilla looks effing awesome. <laughs> Good to look at and often. Awesome. That, yeah, that is a good thing, right? A high compliment. You know, it's so, like I had fun doing it. I mean, what the hell? That's the main thing. Enjoying it. You know, it's like it's it. It isn't like a drudgery. It's not a job. It's just boom, plunge into it and do the best you can do. There's probably a lot worse things that you could be doing for uh, a living at this point. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Pretty fortunate. I've been doing this for a long time. Long time. So I think we're going to talk about drawing, right? This week, something. We are. Uh, so you know, when we talked, it was either the end of last week or earlier this week. Um, you know, we got we got to talking about how, through the course of of the show, you have shown us painting several times, right? Yep. But, but we always talk about how at this, the, the point of applying the paint to the canvas, all the hard stuff is already figured out. Yeah. Right. You've already figured out uh, your pillars of, of, of art, as you say, which is the, the, the composition, uh, right. the drawing, the technical drawing. Yep. Um, now my mind's going to blank out on me. The lighting scenario, the subject matter right. and the color. Right. You know, last but not least, the color. You already have all of that figured out what you're going to be doing ahead of time. Mm -hmm. So as, as we got talking, we thought it might be interesting just to kind of show how you approach that creative thought process and what it's like when you sit down uh, to a blank page yeah. and, and begin that. Now, I know most of the time like when you're working on a job you already have an idea formulated somebody has given you right something this is something what they want to think, mm -hmm. something to think about but i'm going to ask you this question bef before you get into all of that now when you set down to create your your own stuff right, right. whether it's your morning doodles and your brain dumps as, as we refer to right. them or a uh, just a private piece that you mm -hmm. occasionally get to work on those with the same kind of already mulling an idea around or do you develop the idea as the pencil flows across the page well i i start with with an idea generally speaking i mean i'm not going to say it 100 percent of the time but there will be an idea and if that's a composition or a uh if i've if i've had a a dream say or that state i like that state where you're just drifting off to sleep so the conscious is leaving you and the subconscious is rising in the, that point where they both meet like like you know dusk or dawn mm -hmm. and an image forms so i'll, I'll kind of see that and I'll, and I'll and i'll get i'll sketch that down or if i'm i'm trying to whatever whatever it happens to be if it's something for me if it's if it's say if it's a, a pinup painting you know I, I, the subject gene and i have discussed the subject pretty much so what what the the environment will be what what story is being told with the picture and so i'll have all that information i would say 95 percent of the time i've already got an idea of what i'm going after 
and then before the pencil ever touches down before the pencil touches and then as the pencil moves around on the paper other stuff starts to happen things starts to happen i mean i can talk over a project with somebody like trying to be an orchestra when i do their work and have, we'll, we'll be discussing it on the phone four ways different people you know when paul was alive now but now with adam his, his the new man the manager always been the manager and gene and i will talk and I'm not sketching anything. I'm taking notes. Gene's taking notes. And when I sit down, I'll look at all those notes and then start to draw some image that out of all that business. And sometimes that just starts to spread and take its own life on. You know, it just is. It's, mm -hmm. It just moves. It's like that, that dot that just starts to move and move and move. And anyway, I, I found one a bunch of pile of sketches for a private commission that uh, last year, I think it was, a gentleman wanted a, a blackboard rendering. That's what I do those renderings on black illustration board with Prismacolor pencils. And he wanted yep. an image of Luthien, the elf maiden from the Silmarillion, and Baron, her husband. And they get they, 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 they approach Morgoth, one of the main, the, the main protagonists in the Silmarillion. That's the book that Tolkien wrote, I think 1925 or so, whenever he was developing the whole background for the rings, all the mythology and the gods and the creators and the titans of his story. And that, I remember when it first came out, after Tim and I illustrated the rings, and I read it way back then, I forgotten completely what the hell the story was all about. It just all the layering of it is so massively complex, you know. So I had to go back and look it up and find out what the hell was going on. And anyway, she's this, the most beautiful maiden in, in all of Elfdom back in the day. And so she's gotten into Morgoth's stronghold, the, the, again, the main evil uh, protagonist, and her husband, they've transformed, I think, he into a, a wolf, she into a bat, but they get there. And her, her gig was she could sing and dance. I, we made her dancing. The, the client like wanted to see her dancing also and okay. put, put the bad guy to sleep <laughs> in order to go and steal one of the Silmarillion, the magic jewels from his crown. You know, but she would put him to sleep. So I, I just started with this first sketch, like that would be the first one. She's dancing in the foreground. And not only that, but he's getting turned on. As much as Tolkien would write about such erotic behavior, it was very, very minimalistic. And it was couched in kind of different language, but generally that's what was happening. So he's back here in my first sketch in the background here. And 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 the her and Baron is, is the werewolf. And I got her in a book. Because this this the guy, when the guy commissioned, when he called me, he said he wanted me to combine my Tolkien work with my pinup work. So okay. I figure, well, so, she yeah, should so look right there. You've kind of yeah. Uh, so sure, her you won't see anything, but she would be transparent. The dress is transparent, all backlit. Again, my, I love that backlighting. So she's okay. real. So that's a sketch, and then I do. Then I just simply start making a whole bunch of other different poses and attitudes, and then I draw okay. that one. Before you jump ahead, before you jump ahead, do you typically start off on that? That was an eight and a half by eleven. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pretty much on a small piece of paper, and sometimes. I'll I'll do these sketches much smaller than that. These are pretty big. Sometimes I'll they'll be this big. I'll do a, okay. a half a dozen of them on one page. Just it was stick figures. I'm not yeah, I, no. look. And at this phase right now, I'm not particularly concerned about good drawing at all. That, that you know, okay. it just is basically positioning of the figure and the attitude, the acting. That's the other component. You know, when you get into into it, I know I'm I'm, I'm shooting all over the place, but I wrote a bunch of. Issues aside from the, the big uh, pillars that I talk about, but when you're drawing, you're basically, it's a design job. Uh, it's a research job, number one. You have to go check on, find out, whatever. If it's one of these, if it's a fantasy or it's reality, you've got to go research it. So it's a research job. Then it's a construction job. You're building, you're constructing a scene, a set, you're constructing figures. It's an acting job. While you're sketching, you're acting. What, what's the attitude? What's happening between the figures or with one figure? 
It's an animation job. What's the movement? It's a camera job. Where's your angle? Where's your setup? How are you looking at the scene from? Are you low on the ground? Are you up high looking down? You know, is it a straight dead on 25 millimeter lens shot? It's a lighting job. You're lighting it. Where's the light all coming from? It's sculpting, but really sculpting once you start to render. And especially when you get to paint. And perspective. Understanding perspective and anatomy. So you're really involved with all those issues. And a lot of the times, that all has to be done at lightning speed if you're under the gun. All those things. Yeah. And they all have to fall into place. So anyway, after I do these smaller ones, I do a whole bunch of these. I've only got a couple of them out now. I'll, I'll, I'll start to draw it a little bigger, you know, on a bigger piece yeah, of that's paper. Blasted, that's blasted into your spotlight. Can you angle it just a little bit? Okay. There you go. Thank you. Is okay, that better? Cool. Okay, so we can see now how the figure's starting to... Yeah, it's bigger. Get a little so, uh, I'm doing that, and I'm still drawing all kinds of other poses and attitudes. And then I finally take that, render it up more, so I get the three characters in the scene, you know, the wolf, her, and Morgoth in the background sitting on his throne. So I'm, I'm going like that with a whole bunch of sketches. I'm doing, I keep rendering, little shifting in poses and attitudes. I'll move the figure attitude 20, 50, 30, 40, you know, constantly just keep drawing different figures for no reason other than you just want to play with it. You know what I mean? Just see what happens. How, how concerned with you uh are you with the composition at, at this at this point? Like how much is that in your brain? Totally. The composition's there. You can see she the position I kept him here. She's here, she's the primary center of interest, and the wolf was down here somewhere. So that setup is constantly, I'm, I just keep repeating it now because that's kind of like I'm seeing it until I get to the point where I draw a little more detailed picture of Morgoth. If you can see it, I'm trying to get it so it doesn't, yep. you know? Okay, there you go. Then I say, wait a minute, this guy should be a hell of a lot big. He's a giant. He's way in the distance. So I pull him into the foreground and my, her much smaller because she's tiny in relationship to him. So I bring him up to be very predominant behind her. And then I do a more, he got, He wants one color on it other than the black and the white. And she's all in blue. So I start to render it in on the sketch phase with blue. And I'm thinking of all this backlight from all these sconces and everything. He's really dark and silhouetted. He'll get very dark in the picture in the final. And so, and again, even with that, that setup now, I keep fooling around with the pose and the attitude. And the lighting's all uh, been set up. He's backlit. She's spotlit from the top back, sort of, light coming down, but a little behind her so that the dress is lighter than the body, you see, so she reads more in silhouette. So that, that's kind of like the process. But then finally, I'll show this to the, to the client. He approves it. Then I go, I, I'm trying to remember the figure. I think I was fake, that whole figure is being invented out of my head all the while through this whole thing. And I, I I pretty much invented most of the figures in that when I did the final drawing. You know, I've got piles of reference of, of uh, models and everything. And I probably took some headshots and, and lighting and, you know, used that as a basic guide. But mainly, I invented the whole thing, you know, with that particular job. Most of the time I won't do that, though. I'll get a figure. And I find that not for her, but in various poses, these things work out very well. You can pose these plastic figures. Yeah, get them in great positions, realistic, light them, get the lighting, and it gives you the gist of what you're after. And you, it saves time in a sense. You know, you're sketching, you can get it all while sketching too. You can, you're, in your mind, you're acting it all out. Part of the action and flow of everything. And, but these figures help to arrive at it quicker. So that's just kind of a run through of the procedure a little bit. Okay. So uh, just as a, you know, like a practical drawing kind of thing, um, when you're doing all those, you know, I see right behind you. I don't know how many people watching this right now are going to know what that is, but what is that? Explain that, explain so, that to us and 
and how that comes into play in this process. It's a light box. Normally I don't use it up here. I got I, I got a drawing board over there where I work on it at an angle about like this to me, you see? But I'm, I can use it up here because it's more convenient for the way our camera's all set up and the lights are set up. But it's a light box. I don't know if you can read it. It, it lights up, you know? Yep. Because, I mean, once I start to draw something, I'll stick, I'll, I'll stick the rough underneath it here. Say, you know, take one of these things. In this case, it's goes this way. I've not done this before, so I'm going to be clunking around here. You understand? <laughs> That's quite all right now. <laughs> but I'll, I'll, I'll put, can you see that at all through there? Yeah. You know? So, yes. Yeah, so. You know, I'll, I'll obviously clean this up as I draw it and, and render it and get the drawing right. But then once I get it to a certain point, I want to start to clean it up. Then I lay it on top of here, you know, and then just start getting more, more refined with it. Again, trying to draw it pretty good. But not being too concerned. Some people can draw it right off the bat instantly, and it's a masterpiece. Me, I, I fought to build it up, and I make mistakes, and I, you know, and I keep at it like this. But you start to get it a little more defined. Now, I'm going to ask you a question here. With, I know often sometimes when when people trace over something, uh, it it looks traced. Right. How do you that, avoid? Yeah, that's a good one. You, that's a, that's a great question. Because that it's, I'm not tracing. You see, I'm not here. This is tracing. I'm trying to follow every line underneath here. That's tracing. Mm -hmm. Trying to draw. I'm not concerned about that. I'm concerned about only. Th this is that rough has defined the basic pose and proportions. Now I'm just trying to clean it up. So it's not really a tracing at all. It's just getting a little more and more defined. You know? This is the original version of Photoshop layers. Yeah. So you got to go. This reminds me of my childhood. My mother came in. That's why I never trace. My mother came into the bedroom once. Tim and I would always draw in our bedrooms a lot on the floor, you know. In this particular instance, I was—I had a Bugs Bunny comic book, and I was—I had a piece of paper on the top of it, and I was tracing the cover of the Bugs Bunny comic book, tracing. Trying to get the thick and thin lines just right, following it, you know, that kind of thing. My mother walked into the bedroom and she freaked out. She said, "Stop tracing! Don't trace!" I mean, she—I get this. It, it's still here. She, you know, she was practically yelling at us, "Don't trace!" Copy it. Put the paper here and copy it, but don't trace it. Which was really pretty powerful. You know? Kind of a really strong directive of her trying to influence us. Go from your eye to your brain to your hand. Get that all down. Don't just trace. And so... Don't just trace. I don't trace. I kind of like clean up the sketch that's already there. Except in some instances I might trace. <laughs> For example, what might those instances be? I paint, I collect old toys, you know, like I have these old puppets. I, I have a puppet hang up. Tim and I, I used to make puppets all the time as a kid. Marionettes, hand puppets, and, and ventriloquist puppets. And so I collect these old toys. I've had them for years and years and years. Some of them I, I had when, when I was a kid, not the ones I have now, but ones like them I had as a kid. And I find them in antique stores, and Gene gets them online. And I've been painting their portraits, and in that instance, I'll, 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 I walk into the room where they're sitting, I got them all collect in this room where I have all my old stuff, comic books and everything, and I see the sun is coming through this window over here, hitting on the floor, bouncing back up with this low light on this one, the first one I did, and the lights coming through the window is blue, and I love that, you know, that contrast, the warm and the cool, and I went, whoa! So I went in and shot a picture of it and beautiful lighting, just fantastic. And it's that old 
composition stuff that they used to make all the toys out of, the dolls and the puppets and everything. And mm -hmm. it's all chipped and cracked and peeling. And it got all these textures and everything. And it looks incredible, like the old Tales from the Crypt, you know? And in that case, I want it exactly like that. So I do a tight drawing tracing the photograph. You know, I copy it on the copy machine, blow it up, trace it, and then transfer that to the canvas, a black canvas. Because mm -hmm. I'm not trying to make an interpretation of the puppet, so to speak. You know what I mean? I want it to be exactly like the damn thing looks. You yes, know? okay. You're going for that, a very photorealistic Yeah, exactly. In photorealistic proportion and all that business. So in that case, it will. Other than that, I haven't traced for a long time. So, yeah, so th this is. So I'll, I'll clean this up to a degree. And like I say, if I was going to now do this as a painting, well, I'd get a model. And for in this day and age right now with COVID, it's very tough. And so I've done a few things, but I work at a distance with the particular model I used the last time. Her husband shot the pictures for me at a distance. Well, you're giving, I'm giving the directives of how to light it and everything, you know, I do a little sketch with arrows indicating where the position of the little lights are. And it, it works out. You can make it work out. So now once you, once you settle down on a, on a pose, now in this particular image that we're talking about, you know, the, the, the character from the Tolkien book, the right? Silmarillion. The Morillion. Silmarillion. <laughs> yeah. So, so you, get that, um, you get that initial pose in your head, that one that comes out. Now, do you find yourself, for you in particular, do you end up with something that's ever far away from that initial vision? Or does it usually tend to be somewhere in the ballpark of what you initially put no, down? I'll, I'll try all different attitudes and positions. All over the place. You keep jumping, and in this one, I kept, pretty kept it like this. But some of them, I'll try all kinds of stuff out, and then land on one to show the client. You know, be it a publisher or a private commission, and paint it, go through it. Then I don't know how many times I'll be going through my old sketches of that for that particular painting, and I'll say, "Holy crap! How come I didn't use that one?" <laughs> it'll hit me like the ones that I said no to for some reason are a lot better than the one that I ended up using and then you make decisions which are very esoteric in the moment that aren't you know what I mean sometimes I'm not sure why you know Gene mm -hmm. will become involved with me at that a lot of the points and then we'll decide on it together you know that's the one. Because I'll do, say, half a dozen sketches and I'll lay them out in front of Gene. And it's a weeding up. No, not that one. No, not that one. You boil it down to the two. And then it's like that one, you know. And sometimes, though, it, not, not that often, I will go back and I'll think, well, that one was much better. I just did that with some, I was going through all my piles of sketches trying to find this stuff. And some of the Spider-Man stuff that I did for Marvel that hit me. It's like, oh my God, how come I didn't use this one? It's, it's, it's 50 times better than the one that I ended up painting. My opinion. I mean, somebody yeah. else, you know, they, I, <laughs> yeah. nobody ever so, saw it. Uh, they don't know. There's nothing to judge it against, you know? Yeah, but it's it's in your head and in your in your knowledge base. Yeah. So I've got a, another question for you. Just, okay, going through those, in, the, in those initial roughs, um, and you get you got to forgive me for forgetting, the names of these characters. I don't. I, I I had to go out. Uh, 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 I'm seeing right now. I'm forgetting them. Uh, Morgoth and okay, that's Luth who I'm talking about. Who's Morgoth, the big. Who's Morgoth is the big bad guy. I'm He's the big bad guy. Now, big ba <laughs> big bad guys sit on thrones a lot. You ever notice that? They always are on a they throne. Do. They don't do much. They sit on a throne. They don't have to do mm -hmm. much. It's command, you know. <laughs> so. He, you had him smaller off in the back and all yeah. those initial yeah. renderings. 
But you then made the jump to draw a just a page of just him. Right. Right. So yeah, okay. So he's back there hanging out in the background. Yeah. It, do you typically draw just an individual page of your background characters like that? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Well, all of them. I'll I'll uh I know wait a minute. Hold on for a minute. What the hell is it? I know we were only going to cover one thing here, but I had some other stuff here too. We can just quickly, I think, zip through if I can find it. Wait a minute. While he's looking through there, we'll say, you know, hey, thanks for everybody that is tuning in. Uh, I'm sure Greg will say hello when he sits back down. But Adrian and Adrian, Michael and Nina, uh, thanks for tuning in and joining in on the chat. Much appreciated. If anybody has any questions for Greg, um, I can't find out. I don't remember the process or anything at all. Please feel free to uh, you know chime in. I don't have. I, I don't have. If you're watching this trick. I can't find it now. But what I'll do is, I'll 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 say I'll draw this guy. Okay. Yep. If that's the guy or the girl, you know, and then on this copy machine, I'll blow them up fifty percent, twenty percent, eighty percent. However, reduce or enlarge, and cut them out. With the scissors mm -hmm. or exacto blade, and I'll start to move them around on the page within the within the picture plane. You know, setting the main center of interest where I decide it should be. Then I start to move stuff around, separate pieces, rather than constantly drawing the thing over and over and over and over and over again. You just cut out stuff, move it around. You said, "What? I'll make that one a little bit bigger." That's why a copy machine is so convenient. You can just blow it up 10%, 20%, whatever you think, you know? So the, generally speaking, I'm working in all these separate parts, background, figures, parts of backgrounds, props or objects and backgrounds, and moving them around. Avo the key thing there is right, avoiding tangents, not letting things uncomfortably touch, but having it either cross over or this way, you know? So Greg, as you move on, you know, we got uh, several people here watching, chiming in, saying hello. So I gave them hello when you walked away, and I said that you would say hi back when you back. sat down. <laughs> there you go. So, so in your, you know, <laughs> separating that background figure out, drawing him, and then blowing him up, that's when it dawned on you that this guy... Yeah, it, it, it's part of the story, I mean, too. The what, what is it you're trying to convey? This guy's a huge, terrifying being. You know, he's mm -hmm. like, I think a tiny in the background is not the issue here, you know? You want the comparison of the size and the might and the power of the figure next to the, next to the, uh, next to the good guys, you know? And in him, the Baron... He's in, in in the text, he's cowering. He's like a you know, like a, he's that whole hunched over submissive thing that, you know, canine do. Okay. So I was yes, trying to convey okay. that, you know. And then, But so, it's all separate pieces. Everything is all a separate part. You know. Can you do me a favor? Can you hold up one of the near final composition and then one of the earlier ones? Just so we could see the difference and the effect that it had on the composition as a whole. Uh, okay. Yeah. And I got more confused here now. Sorry to make well, you here, to dig around. Here, no, it's, it's, no, no, no. Here's like the first one. All right, there, that's that's the first picture that I drew. Yep. And here's like the last one. Yeah. Yeah. So, so he's he's over her, you know. I mean, he's big and behind her. That dominant kind of like thing. And and not only that, you get the. You, you, yep. You kept that uh, a. a almost a triangular composition in there. Yeah. 
that's but, that's but basically. going from her being the apex to him becoming the apex and serving as a border like almost a frame around her right yeah exactly Am I seeing that correctly yeah yeah he he uh he this coming down here and there so i mean I but that, that this is a very interesting process to watch because most people you know that are of the younger generations that are creating now are are doing what you're doing but in photoshop you know so they have it in the layers and they can move everything around and, and all that and having no idea how they could have done that exact same stuff but in a very traditional analog you know format yeah <laughs> you know i i just so much to the point of a copy machine yeah I like, uh, well, you know, it's what you get used to. I mean, I like the physical process. Of course, yeah. And it, it, it not, it, it's like when I, I've, I've talked to people who make films now digitally, you know, everything's digital. Mm -hmm. They say, oh, my God, you never edited on a movie, movie Yola. Oh, my God, that's, you're missing something, man. And I explain, well, what's that about? And I explain the whole process. And they go, oh, my God. Like, all oh, that, that. You gotta pull the thing off the moviola, your splice. You gotta you gotta take a frame out because it's it's your timing's off there. Just doesn't look right to you. Start the machine, unhitch it, pull the film out, go over to your table over here, some distance away, and break the film apart. Sh cut it in your hot splicer. Cut a frame off. Scrape the emulsion off. Now put glue on it. Clamp down the hot splicer and wait a minute until the glue dries. <laughs> And you pull it out, you put it back into the Muyoa, you know, lock it with your soundtrack with your cutting through and rind it back a little bit, start it up again, 24 frames a second. Nope, still off. I explained that. And, ah, but that was fun. I, I enjoyed that. Yeah. I don't know why. You know, it's just you get used to it, you know. Well, certain things in that involve uh, a a process like that can become cathartic in nature you know sure. you're th thinking about it but then you're going through these motions of doing this stuff and, and the repetition of it all becomes almost a meditative practice exactly you know? meditative you know in that you're meditating and you're analyzing you know all that time yeah. is used up it isn't just wasted and yes exactly and so, yeah, so this is like that. I mean, it's all separate pieces moved around again, finding that right setup moving. And if you get the figure and you get it just right, superimposed in the head, but the arm is in the wrong position where you simply just cut the arm out and you move it over or you redraw it and you pull it down and you take that down and then you keep assembling. So it, it's all a, a, a taped together bunch of pieces, you know? And then once I arrive at the final tape together a bunch of pieces, then I'll just make a big copy of that, you know, so it's all on one sheet. So then I can lay the paper on top of it and start to clean that up. So I'm only looking through one sheet of paper rather than half a dozen layers of it, you know? Got you. Okay. So, so that's how you, you know, you approach a job and, a, a lot of your different type of work. What about when you sat down and uh, something that probably most of the people here are not familiar with, uh, your, the cartoons that you make, right? Like, I'm going to throw out a name that no one will know the reference to uh, unless they happen to see it on Instagram when it was posted a long time ago, but Bathman. <laughs> oh, I... I I, it's it's I have boxes filled with sarcastic uh, surrealistic satirical nonsensical totally like Edward Leary nonsensical sentences names invented names of people like I really loved the way Charles Dickens would invent names you know Mr. Jaw King <laughs> Like he was in Scrooge, right? In, in, in 
Christmas, this jaw king. You know, like, wow, what the hell does jaw king mean? You know, Scrooge, Ebenezer Scrooge. I love names like that. So I, they, they, they pop into my head inadvertently um, with no, there's no conscious effort to do it. And I've got boxes and sketches come to me like that, drawings and ideas. You know, just playing on words, uh, puns, you know, carsophagus. So I draw a picture of a mummy with, with, on wheels. <laughs> <laughs> do those things, ever, like when you're in the middle of a job working, right? Do those <clears throat> things just pop in your head and you're like, okay, I got to stop. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll be uh, somewhere in a room, somewhere in the house, and that thing will jump into my head something, and I don't have a piece of paper. I'll have to run to a piece of paper to get it down somewhere. I, I keep a pile <laughs> of paper and pencils in the bathroom. <laughs> you know, don't, why waste time, right? And, yeah, but stuff, it just happens, and wait a minute. I'll be right there. Okay. I'll just right, pop we'll just through. Hang out. I'll pop just through some of these things. Selection. What's that, sir? Like, like these kind of things hit me. Heavy deer area. You know, it's like you see a sign. <laughs> you ever see? <laughs> right? You see? <laughs> you see them, right? Heavy deer. I was like, what the hell? I went home and drew a picture yeah. of a heavy deer. God damn. Or I remember we were standing in line at Comic Con a couple of years ago. Even he has to stand in line to get. <laughs> I mean, here's the, here's the left hand of God. Take that, you ungrateful piece of shit. Huh? What's that? Back it off. Oh, I didn't hear you, hon. <laughs> but here was the main one that we you, did, right? The brain dump? Yes, the brain dump. Dean says that, funny enough, he has a drawing of a sphincter and a sphinx combined. So a what? The sphincter. The oh. sphincter. Yeah. I mean, those things are fun to do. They're, they're a creative uh, uh, outlet. They're just sort of like, you know? And so those those come to you though, very spontaneously, right? Yeah. Just there's no there's no thought about it. There's there's not there's like no an effort plan. of sitting. Yeah, the, the, it's not like sitting down and trying to come up with something, you know. It, but now, there are different ideas that I have. Like this one, I had this sketch. It's a serious one. It came to that where my dreams come from. It was me standing as a little kid. It just kind of okay. came into focus. I'm standing here in this black draped robe, really somber, with all these dead bodies behind me, and in a city in total destruction, and probably in meteorites all coming down. You know? So that's, and I have no idea why or where it comes from, you know? No, you said that came from a dream, or that it just that came half that that, that that not from a you would call it a dream. I don't know. Does that happen with you? I mean, where you're drifting off to sleep. Yes. Yeah. And and an image just forms. Yep. That's where yeah. that came from. So it's not coming from the yeah. conscious effort at all. It's coming from a subconscious space. Those are intriguing to yeah, me. I painted. Good those images in the past like that you know i've got one in progress right now that 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 came to me in in that way uh that when i get to get it to a certain point i, I want to show it to you so you can and, and uh see what it is right but you know we'll you know i can talk about it later rather than yeah boring everybody with the details of it now but um so you said uh with with some of that just developmental stuff or the working of the sketches do you 
ever go through the same refinement process or you just want off those things? Sometimes I'll clean them up, you know, you know. uh, I'll do a little tighter. Some of them are funny, you know, like a lot of them are funny or I think they're funny. Well, like the heavy deer area. Oh. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I've seen quite a bit of them. I, they're hysterical to me. I, I get yeah. a kick at them. I think we need to, we need to start, uh, promoting that side of of greg the the political or the daily cartoon side of Greg. yeah they're you know yeah that's that's that their their whole thing in itself also i mean i've, I've drawn a lot of sketches of my members as well. i was doing an autobiography kind of like thing where i've got a whole stack mm-hmm. of drawings that i that i've done remembering i went back and tried to remember the very first thing that i could that that I could remember, you know, and it's it's very young, and I start to draw that stuff out, you know, and th- those are interesting, because I think the 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 you think that you can't remember them, and and that there's a germ of it, which I I find out that once I start to draw it down, it's 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 seemingly getting clearer in my mind, as I'm starting to draw it, the remembrance of it. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. And I wonder it, how it's all there somewhere, right? It's all yeah, trapped in a gray cell somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> Unless that one got blasted out somehow. <laughs> um you know so you know with this, you know, you were you were drawing back there. Um did you want to do any you know live drawing or, or Anything that tonight, or do you want to focus on just more discussion about thumbnails and yeah, sketching I, I, process of drawing? Or? Yeah, I don't know what to do exactly. I mean, you know, it's like I don't think it's. I, I, I didn't even. I was trying to figure out what, what we we're going to do tonight, and, and the main thing that hit me was just to go over the process and just discuss it more or less, you know. And when I get clearer, because I've got a couple of jobs coming up that I'd like to do. If I get the approval to do them live yeah. from the from the you know from the people I'm doing them for, I'd like to do that. That that I could do this. Got to do the sketching phase of it. You know, could, Jane. Yeah. Could I say who that is that we're doing them for? Oh, okay. <laughs> so, yeah. Better to be safe than than sorry on that. But um. So yeah, anybody t- that's that's tuning in, if you have any other questions a- about this process or chiming in, we've got people talking about their process and uh, being tuned into that subconscious, you know, stream all the time. Or, you know, Paul Shipper mentions that, you know, that he's figured out compositions while he's been sleeping. You know, oh yeah. I guess in a in a dream state and then waking up and knowing exactly yeah, what cool. to do, which. Now, for me, I had quite the opposite of that. I don't know if it's ever happened to you. I, in a dream one time, uh, I created the best painting that ever existed in the world. Yeah. Right. And it was in the dream, it was universally recognized as the, the best painting ever. And then I woke up and had no idea of what it looked like. <laughs> None. I hate when that happens. <laughs> it was there. What is it? Yeah, that's that's interesting. The, the thing, the thing is, too, I mean, I don't. What? We get a question for you. Uh, Howard Lawson's asking, do you do uh, do you do color comps at all? Yeah, well, here, like this here, not a color comp. I mean, I I just put in the blue on her dress a little bit. Sometimes I will. So, yeah, yeah. Sometimes I will. And, and uh, more often than I don't, more often than not, you know, I don't. Uh, I think it's, I think by this point, I think it through while I'm doing the drawing and understanding the lighting setup and understanding all the colors that are in the picture, because that the, the subjects define what the color of all the objects are. But you mm-hmm. use the subject when you know what all the colors of the objects are. Then the next thing that affects all that is, of course, the color of the light. And once I get that in my head, I figure that all out. 
and I pretty much got it all thought through because I think I find that sometimes and sometimes not that it takes the edge off of the painting if you do a color comp ahead of time. In other words, the if you get it too well defined ahead of time before you start the painting and you work everything out, well, what the hell's the point of doing the painting? Kind of like thing. There's a certain there's a certain uh, excitement about the fact that you're going to be finding it out as you paint it, in a way. Even though you've thought it all through, no. pretty much so, you may run into stuff that you didn't anticipate, and that's the that's pretty much the what should I say the juice or excitement of doing the painting. Now, do you find that that has developed over the course of your career? Uh, or you've just kind of always worked that way from like the beginning? What's? No, 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 that, that's developed. I had, I had to really struggle, you know, like everybody else does as you're learning, you know? You're, you're constantly in the unknown and, and struggling through it to try to figure it out. And I'm not yeah. saying that I got it all figured out. Don't get me wrong. It's not by a long shot. But I do have a lot of information that I've gathered over the years that I rely on <laughs> to pull, do a picture, you know? Yeah. And then yeah. you want to try stuff within that, though, that you didn't necessarily try before. You know? And you find out certain things. Like, again, I keep referring back to this painting of this house that I did several months ago. You know? Where... The shadow yeah. color yep. I couldn't arrive at, and Gene suggested, we'll use black. And I just freaked out, black, I can't use black, because I got this hangover about using black as a crutch. And it worked very yes. extremely well, yep. which I didn't anticipate, you know? And <laughs> uh, so, you know, you're, 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 I'm always finding something out, but there's less of it. There's less, there's less uh, anxiety or breakdown, you know, than there used to be. Okay. Now, I know uh, during the beginning of your American Beauty series, you were doing a ton of, like, you know, marker drawings and yeah. and yeah, then I, at, then... at that particular time, like, particularly at the beginning of that series. Yeah. You were, you had a lot of those things out. Yeah, I did. Now, that, you know... I guess, I, I approached that on that level. Then I wanted to try it out and see what the hell happened and try to define it. Because I wasn't, I hadn't done the, that kind of work before, and I wanted to try it out in you know that process and see what happened. You know. Okay. Very cool. It, so it, uh, it, 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 it's on and off. Once in a while, I'll do it. You know, I'll do it just to see how uh, it feels. See if that if I like that the way that looks. You know, and sometimes yeah. mainly I'll do it to indicate color for somebody that I'm doing a picture for. You know, to let them see it yep. to some degree. Okay, to help sell the idea. And yeah. You have a feeling before you move right. on. Okay, that, that makes sense. That makes sense. It's, so it's, we have Mark Fountain who says uh, a thank you from his heart's bottom. He's been a fan of you for, for 40 years. So awesome. Thank uh, you. And I know the I know the answer to this one, but I'm going to ask you anyway from uh and again with the names that i'm not sure if i'm pronouncing correctly my apologies kiwi or kiwi has john favreau contacted you about any future star wars projects and working on them no no <laughs> no no nope. i think so always an option though right huh uh did jane what? did you say something Easy answer, she said. No. Yeah, <laughs> easy answer. I am uh, working Steve on... Steve Bunn. Uh, what? Steve Bunn? Hi, but Steve. Steve Bunn says that you're, uh, that he thinks that your best painting is the goddess Diana. And it just always looks so 3D to him. You mean from the Gods and Goddesses series, probably, right? Steve? Yeah, I think so. That's an oldie. I did, what, half a dozen paintings in Greek and Norse mythology. Way back. Okay. And Dean has a very interesting question here. When's the last time you tried something new which really didn't work out well? 
Good grief. What was the question? When was the last time I tried something new that didn't really work out well? Can you think of something? Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, it all depends on your opinion about what works out well. Yeah, what, if, yeah. if it works out well or not. <laughs> in, in your opinion, have you, like, anything that you were like... I, look, you know me, I, I, how many times do I go through this? I think that, you know, you, I mean, artists are never satisfied with what they end up with. You're always, your expectations are way up here and, and well aware of the fact that I'll never achieve that. And, you know, I accept that. You know, it never, there's a level that you keep aiming at, I think, that I keep comparing myself to the greats. And when I go back and look at the greats, it's like, oh, come on, you know, <laughs> but I mean, I'm glad that I'm, I'm, you know, I'm glad that people don't feel that way generally, but, you know, as the artist, that's, you know, that, yeah. that's a sense that I have that, I mean, well, you're also you're in a very interesting position, um, a very fortunate position, is that you are constantly busy. Yeah, you're constant. You're constantly busy with work and jobs, and you know that's not a lot of time to experiment with new media, and and things yeah. of that nature. Well, yeah, you know I mean? yeah. I, I'm not interested so much in exploring new media. Now, it's like, uh, you know, acrylic is fine with me when I paint. I, I don't really care about oils or anything like that. I don't need to, you know, I'm just trying to get a picture out. That's all. And it isn't the medium, so to speak, that particularly interests me. You know, it's, it's getting mm -hmm. to the final thing. I don't, it's hard to explain it. I love the process. What's, what's that, huh? She's switching the medium. Usually gives me a headache. Uh, <laughs> I don't know how to phrase it exactly. I'm trying to get at you know something that's. Oh, I did tearing the pirates with Tim, my brother, for in ink, and I had to do ink. And holy shit, I'm not an inker, you know. I mean, I've done ink drawings professionally, but that is such a specialized medium form that, and there's so many masters at it now, you know. <laughs> that you you try it and you study them all and you're really you, it's that was that was that was a bitch <laughs> that gave me a lot of grief and i did it for a year and i wanted to keep it up for at least two more years i figured i could have got a handle on it after that you know at three years i might have started to get a handle on it but the newspaper strip storytelling realistic strip day was dead it was over with no newspaper were buying the strip so that came to, but it, there's, I'm not, I don't know how to put it. I mean, even when I was making films, the, the, I loved the physical process, but I wasn't into all the crazy minutia. I mean, I'd go over to F and B Seco to, to do film rental and the F and B Seco was the biggest film rental company in the city, you know, all professionals, dollies, cameras, cranes, you name it. And you'd go in and pick up your, you'd call in your order, camera, tape recorder. All I ever worked with was one or two types of cameras, either an Eclair handheld or uh, Aeroflex and a Niagara tape recorder and several types of mock, the shotgun mic. And that's all I ever was interested in. And you'd go into the lobby waiting with the guys and they're all doing shop talk, and pitching all the lenses at each other. And so one of the Miller, did you see the new 90 millimeter lens? And I never was really interested in any of that in that sense. And I appreciate it. Don't get me wrong. You know what I'm saying? And the mechanics and the, and the creation of it and the engineering of it. But I, I, I was only interested in, in, in getting it shot and getting it, getting the story told up there. Not, not all the teeny nitty gritty around it. I, I don't know if that's clear or not. Yes. I, yeah, I got you. I got you. The, Getting the point across is more important that important than the material in which you use to get that point across. Yeah, exactly. That, this happens to be a, a way to do it that you get used to or you find yourself into for one reason or the other. It's like I never planned to be anything that I ended up doing. 
you know, like uh, I just wanted to draw and make and build and, and construct things as a kid. And then animation was the main love, initial love. And learn how to do that. Tim and I were self-taught. We learned it very well, and then got into it. But I never, I never chose to be an illustrator. I mean, that thing, I appreciated illustrators, but I never made the decision that that's what I want to do for a living. I want to do this. I want to do special effects. Fell in love with doing special effects. Started building our own miniatures and filming them with our eight millimeter camera and everything. I want to do that. I wanted to do makeup. Started, you know, like William Tuttle's stuff that he started to develop all the appliances back in the day at, I think at MGM. The seven things of Dr. Lau, all these makeups and everything. I was totally getting into that and doing make. I was all over the place. I didn't. I don't know. I'm just rambling. <laughs> yeah, you're fine. That's one thing. It's, it's interesting when I, you know, when I talk to you, that love for film and filmmaking really comes through. I think that that was it initially. Like I say, animation was it, and then special effects. And cinematography, to me, and Tim, the star of the movie when we would go see it would be the cinematographer, the the special effects crew. Those are the stars of the movie. I, I The lighting, I'd go see these things, and that's where all the warm light think that we do now i think comes from like you know that warm like cool like thing comes from old technicolor movies I, i'd see that and come home and try to recreate that in in in, in drawing or it with colored pencils you know and mm -hmm. film was a huge huge influence yeah yeah it's 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 evident it's evident in the way you speak that that there was a passion there <laughs> you know but, <laughs> Do you ever do you ever think about? I know that you know you worked in you know documentary filmmaking and animation in the early days. Do you ever you know daydream or reminisce about that path, that career path, or ever doing something of it now? Well, yeah, if the opportunity arose where I could be involved in a film, yeah, I'd love it for sure. I mean, I'm not going out looking for it right now. And, but if it, you know, I have fell in your lap, you would definitely yeah, do if it. something came along and. You know, whatever. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I uh, it, it's yeah. I would love to be involved. But I mean, we were watching what the hell movie? What did we watch the other day? Hon? It was one of the X Men films. One of the ones that John John Dykstra, the X Men. Which one that Dykstra did? John Dykstra did the special effects for. And of course, I knew John. Met John back when we did Urshirak, and he was on board for doing the special effects and producing Urshirak. Our, our, our fantasy novel that Tim and I wrote, an illustrator, a friend of Jerry Nichols, did the text, and then we worked on the whole thing together. But uh, that film came to an end, and it's like you watch. I, I like to watch the credits. I mean, of course, in the old days, you watch the credits were up front because they would just give you the main people, special effects, mm -hmm. and you get the main guy, Gordon Jennings, George Pals, War of the Worlds, and then maybe a couple of assistants, art director Al Mozaki. Now it's like art. Under special effects, there's 20 different special effects crews. It isn't crews, even yeah. one company. It's like 20 companies are doing it. Gets to the end of that one film, and it says this film provided jobs for 15,000 people. I, I, you know, I'm totally naive about this whole world. To me, that is yeah. overwhelmingly mind-boggling. How the hell could you manage that? How is no, that managed? Yeah, there's more people on that film crew than where I grew like in the town where I grew up. Yeah. Well, you think in my remembrance is I worked in industrial film in Detroit, like I say, you know, in the animation department and then some live action also. And, you know, it's a yeah. small setup. And then you're doing that stuff. I And then the films that I did for Fulton J. Sheen were Tim and me. We were the we were the camera crew. That was it. Two guys mm -hmm. running camera and sound and figuring the film out and editing and everything. That was it. Two people. So I, I don't know what this is like. This world. It's beyond me. You know, I, when I say yeah, I'd like to be involved in a film. Where and how? <laughs> and what? Where, how, and what? All right, man. That that's bringing us to five o'clock today. 
So as always, we do our um, closed shop, you know, financials and stuff. Uh, one thing, yeah, we have to we have to point out that um, one of your Marilyn Monroe paintings is out right now. Uh, tomorrow is the last day. If anybody is interested in a Greg's interpretation of a Marilyn Monroe pinup painting, go to gotta have rock and roll.com. Gotta have rock and roll.com. Uh, Greg's image in the painting is right there on the home page. You can see it, click on it, bid on it. We've also sent out uh, emailers for that. So if you're on our email list, uh, a reminder will come out tomorrow. You could check it out. It's a phenomenal painting of Marilyn. Very, very beautiful. And as always, uh, check out our Instagram page, you name it, the website where you can see all of Greg's artwork and purchase that which is still available. Right there on the bottom left-hand corner of the screen, the spiderwebart.com. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming in, tuning in, joining in. We uh, really appreciate it. We have fun with all this. So thank you very much. And of course, uh, thank you, Greg. We appreciate your wisdom. Thank you, Keith, again. And goodbye, everybody. It's all Gene coming in. Hi, Gene. Hi. So, all right. Good night, everyone. Okay. Thank you all for tuning in. Bye. Good night. Good night.